Hello folks. Been a while since I did any vlogging on here. Um, I, the last one that I did, uh, I believe I was just about to start uh, finishing my bird's eye maple violin. And so uh, I got that one done. I've been working with it. Um, and uh, just thought I'd update you to see or to uh, to let you know how everything went out, everything turned out. Um, so the the bird's eye maple violin it turned out to be just as I thought. Uh, it's a very beautiful violin. I'll I'll show you uh, give you a close up of the of the bird's eye itself, and uh, hopefully that's about the right angle. But so that's how it finished, um, and that's on the sides and the back, and on the neck. You'll, you'll see it on there as well. Uh, the top is a uh, spruce, as they always are. And what I did was, uh, I think I was I had some outlandish idea about using, uh, making it a bright orange or something like that, but I didn't have the nerve to try anything like that. So, so what I did was I went to uh, Lee Valley and I talked to their uh, expert, their color expert there, and I ended up choosing a uh, what they called an antique cherry um, uh, varnish or a, a stain, sorry. And so I uh, I rub you know rub the stain on, and uh, it it actually turned out quite nice. I think the the top here it's got a bit of a an antique look to it, and uh, with the accessories here they kind of match, and with the bird's eye, very nice looking violin. And I, I put a a decent set of strings on it. But uh, it doesn't sound very good. Uh, the, the sound itself is, is good, but the projection of this violin is very, very poor. And I'm not sure. I'm doing a bunch of uh, research and, and practicing on, on violins to see uh, what I can do to uh, uh, what we call tune, tune the, the plates and uh, see what kind of sound you can get out of them. Now, it, it's possible that, that I put too much varnish on it. Uh, that's a possibility. The other possibility, though, is that with uh, bird's eye maple, with uh, with all those knots, they they don't actually um, they don't actually make them as thin as what as what a lot of violins could be, and so that could affect the the volume of the violin. So, anyways, what I'm going to do, um, I I need a a quiet violin to take up to camp to play in my room. So I'm going to take this one up there with a and put a mute on it. And I think that one, that one will, uh, it'll serve that purpose for now. So uh, just as an aside, the violin I'm playing on right now, <laughs> I picked this one up uh, in the city here. I went to look at a five string violin, just a kind of a novelty. And uh, the lady had a bunch of older violins there. I tried this one and I thought, well, that's got there's some there's some uh, some soul some character to it even though it was you know not very well looked after, so I gave her a couple hundred bucks for it and and uh, brought it home. Discovered there was a, a crack that I couldn't really see underneath the the, uh, the saddle or the uh, tailpiece and the chin rest. So I took it apart, repaired the crack, and uh, repaired some other things that uh, other little problems that I had found in there. And uh, like I say, I spent you know, a couple hundred bucks on it, and uh, I decided, well, let's let's see what a really top-notch set of strings will do. So I put a set of Eva Parazzi strings on it, and the strings alone were about hundred and forty dollars. And man, oh man, uh, for just a, a nameless, faceless, like it's a Strad copy violin, it's probably you know fifty years old plus all of that, maybe fifty to hundred. But does it ever have volume? The the projection is just incredible. On it. So uh, so yeah, this is the one I'm playing on right now, um, and kind of enjoying it. <clears throat> so what my uh, project right now? I mentioned a little bit earlier that I'm I'm going to work on uh, trying to tune plates on the next violin I build. Now this is a, a white violin that I bought off of uh, off of eBay, and it's made in China, like virtually everything is nowadays, and that's not always necessarily a bad thing. Uh, some of it 
the workmanship can be pretty decent actually. So um, to begin with, uh, I wanted to check the thickness of the plates and from, from what I uh, discovered, all the great makers, whether it was Stradivarius or Amati or, or a Guarnaria, Guarnarius, whoever it was, they all had their own formulas uh, for everything they did. <clears throat> and some of them learned, like a Stradivarius learned from Amati, but they all had their signature thickness of plates. Now the, the plate will, be, uh, will always be a little bit thicker down the middle, down the belly, and, uh, and then it'll get thinner towards the sides. So, so I had to get a, a fairly uh, um, precision um, caliper to measure the thicknesses, and that's where I'm at right now. Is just is just checking to see what they did at the factory, and so we map that all out. We map map the thickness of the uh, of the plates, top and bottom, or uh, top and back. And then, uh, so once we get, you know, uh, whatever I decide, whoever I decide to follow as far as thickness of the plates goes, then I'll take and I'll shave these plates down ever so minutely. We're talking like, you know, a tenth of a millimeter, uh, and that kind of thing can make a huge difference. So once you get, once you get the, uh, the thickness of the plate uh, to where you want it, then, then we have to and this, this is what I'm learning. It's all YouTube kind of stuff because I don't have anybody to learn from. So then the next step is to uh, tune the plates by, by tap toning. And uh, you, can, you can use uh, you know, microphone and computer software programs like Audacity to measure the frequency of the plates. But one fellow, uh, David Lang Sather is his name, and he's uh, out of Oregon. He's been working on tap toning for about 20 years. Um, and so what he's, what he's doing is uh, he's got a, I made this template from uh, how he described it on his website. So it's about 3.8 millimeters thick. And then it has this sound bar that uh, goes from, uh, I can't remember what it is now, six tenths of an inch down to three tenths or something like that. So you establish the frequencies of this and he's got a he's got a recording on his web, website that you can actually compare you you probably won't be able to hear it on the video itself but you compare um, uh, frequencies so for instance and on on the top plate you would want the same frequency all the way around so you would go can't hear it there but but you can tell that there's different frequencies so even though the factory has probably made the the plate the correct thickness because of the variations in density of the wood uh, you'll get different sounds different frequencies so the trick then becomes to to take a scraper and uh, you use a round scraper I think I have one here somewhere you take a round scraper and you you scrape just ever such such a slight amount off of it and you continue to test and you might want uh, 178 hertz uh, average for the top plate 186 hertz for the back and uh, so Lang Sather will even uh, he'll even tap tone everything the, the, the ribs he'll tap tone the, the neck the scroll. He'll do the whole thing, even the end pin and the tailpiece once it's all once it's all in the bridge. And theoretically, at least this is what he's saying, is that once you've got the whole thing uh, tuned so that the frequencies are all the same, that's when you get the 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 most consistent um, ease of uh, playability and the best sounding violin. And you can do it. You can do Lots of things apparently like, you know, give it better projection, um, you know, maybe a, a nice low um, throaty tone, that sort of thing. So anyways, that's what I've been doing. It's, uh, uh, I continue to amass tools that 
aren't cheap <laughs> but uh, uh, it's intriguing and uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it so uh, um, and I continue to learn to play as well although I won't torture you with a tune right now but uh, at least I'm not getting worse put it that way <laughs> so uh, anyways till next time I'll, I'll if you're interested oh and by the way if uh, if there are any experienced luthiers uh, watching this video I sure would welcome any any advice or information you could share some people will apparently scoff at this at this Langsather's Lang idea of, of uh, tap toning this way but I think I think the great masters I think they all did that um, the other thing that I found sort of intriguing was that was that there's a geometry and a mathematics involved uh, as far as the, the the violin and the sound goes, the uh, the bridge would normally sit here uh, between these marks on the F holes, and so um, if you draw an X from uh, I think it's these these lines right here on the F hole, if you draw an X, then that's where the where the bridge where the bridge would sit, and again the Again, the old masters uh, figured out that, that ge geometrically that was the, the way to get the best volume and projection from the violin. Anyways, uh, yeah, I'll uh, keep you up to date. Another few months, maybe I'll uh, have something else, something else exciting to show you. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll talk to you again.